Police! Don't move. I said don't move! I thought the police always said freeze. Well, I am the police. And I say don't move, Snow White. You move, you're dead. And I say I'm dead. And I move. Now, one more step. I'm serious. Then shoot, if you will. Officer Albrecht. What are you, nuts? Walk into a gun? You high? You don't remember me. What are you talking about? How about Shelley? Do you remember Shelley Webster? Shelley Webster is dead, my friend. Hello and welcome to Comic Book Movie Oblivion, the podcast about feature films based on comic books and comic strips that people have stopped talking about. We are your hosts, Jordan Kumar, that's me. And me. And this week we are talking about The Crow from 1994, based on the comic book from 1989. Pause the podcast. I always know, I should remember that this is coming, but I always forget. Uh, I think this is a pretty straightforward revenge narrative. Mm -hmm. And I think even if we spoil it in some way, it's not going to ruin... I think it's more about atmosphere in both the comic and the movie. That's and fair. I yep. don't think it will be ruined if you... I agree. If so you don't bother to... pausing the podcast. Okay, so The Crow by James O'Barr premiered. The first issue came out February 2nd, 1989. We're recording this on February 1st. So it's a 35th anniversary of the comic. Also did not know until five minutes ago that it is Brandon Lee's birthday. The day we're on February recording 1st, it. yeah. Yeah. Not the day that this will come out. No. Yes. Uh, but this week, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the very day we're recording is, yeah. a, is a pretty serious coincidence. Yeah. Very weird. Not unplanned coincidence. Mm. But one of, one of many coincidences that tie in with the movie and the comic and all these... This is a tricky one to talk about. Both the comic and the movie, because there's a lot of... Well, we'll get to all of it. But there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of serious on business going on. On both background. ends. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, anyway, so James O'Brien was a self-taught artist right um as far as we know this is just from online interview stuff he grew up as an orphan he went from foster home to foster home yeah. and then he was engaged at the age of 18 and then his fiance was killed in a wreck with a drunk driver yes he was 18 years old so try to remember how intense you felt about things when you were 18 especially females mm. and to be engaged at 18, what what were the circumstances there? Um, but, of course, it wrecked him. And supposedly, according to him, in interviews, he joined the Marines. That's He, he joined the, uh, some, the Army the or Army. the Marines, something like that. To have some he, kind of structure. Yes. Orderly structure. He, he started drawing this comic. Well, there's, there's a little more, too. Yeah. He joined the Army. As I said, he jo joined the Army. I think he was stationed in Germany. Yes. And, um, unfortunately, the Army found out he could draw. Right. And according to an interview I read with Obar, he said that they put him to work illustrating army textbooks where he was required to draw Whoa. corpses. I didn't hear this part. And, you know, injuries and, and kind of violent imagery. <sighs> okay. Which is kind of the opposite of what he really should have been doing with this Yeah. Time. Terrible. Wow. Okay. So, and as you said, uh, something like 12 years after I think his fiancée passed away, he's still uh, really struggling and as a way of kind of dealing with his grief, he started to write this book. Yeah, called The Crow. So I think around 1981, he starts it. It doesn't get published until 89, as we said. So we're at the 35th anniversary. I don't know if the material in the book in the 89 issues that came out from Caliber Press were the stuff he'd been drawing since 81. I don't know if those pages are part of it or, or if he was redrawing or what the scoop I, is there. I don't know for certain. I'm, I think there was some redrawing because... I read that he changed the hairstyle. Well, there's a lot of shifts in art style. There's yes, there very, very not. I shouldn't say shifts. There are various art styles in it. Yes. It goes back and forth. Yes. Um, the reason I say that, maybe I'm jumping a bit ahead, but when you get to the bad guys, they are very '80s bad guys. These don't seem like 1989 bad guys. They've got like headbands. Um, they look like the Warriors, is yeah. what it looks like. It looks like he, he drew right. them based on the Warriors from 79. It doesn't look like he drew them in 1989. Mm. It seems too late for that stuff. Anyway, so it was published initially by Calibre Press, then by Tundra, then by Kitchen Sink. We'll talk about Tundra. Also, this is like late for a 
black and white indie hit. That was kind of a mid 80s. There was this huge black and white boom that happened with right. Mutant Turtles. Yes. And we'll get to that. When I mentioned Tundra and Kitchen Sink, that's all tied up with Turtles and we'll get to that when we talk about Turtles. That is a huge story that is too big to tell here. Well. It's currently with IDW. I don't even know if the book one is currently in print. I know IDW did some, like, some new Crow comics, but I don't know if this, the f initial volume, is in print at all. So it's about this guy named Eric Draven. It starts, or I don't know if you get his last name in the comic, actually. His name's Eric. Yes. It starts in Medius Res, so he's attacking this guy. Yeah. It's this thug in, a, in the street, a 1980s kind of looking thug. Yeah. And, um... He says that he has already um, attacked this guy named Shelby. He's looking for somebody named T-Bird. Yes. And he's fighting this guy on the street whose name is Jones. And he says that he cut off Shelby's fingers and made Shelby eat them. <laughs> this is what he tells this guy, uh, Jones. And, he sa uh. and, and sh he's looking for T-Bird. Shelby didn't know where T-Bird was even after eating his fingers. <laughs> but he says Shelby pointed him to Jones. Yeah. And he says Jones might know where T-Bird is. He goes to T-Bird. T-Bird doesn't know where. Or sorry, he goes to Jones. Jones doesn't know where T-Bird is. But he leads him to the next guy. And this is basically the chain of the book. Yeah. Is he goes from one guy to the next guy. The next guy knows where the next person is. He knows where the next person is. Yeah. Um, that is intercut with this very, I don't want to be dismissive, but very emo, yeah. gothy exactly scenes of him hanging out in his apartment, <laughs> remembering <laughs> his remembering his, his girlfriend. His girlfriend. Uh, uh, there's a lot of self-harm going on. He's cut himself with a razor. It is very full-on, yeah, very... pretty intense stuff. There's some yeah, moments but... where he's like dancing around. It's interspersed with lyrics from Joy Division <laughs> and The Cure and, and, and Rimbaud, poetry from Rimbaud. Yeah. There's poetry there in French and German that's not translated, it's just yeah. there. I'm afraid this, this, all this stuff is really pretentious. Well, I would <laughs> and... say that's the stuff I actually liked. like. Oh, the, uh, no, I'm the... The apartment stuff... Well, this is part of the reason why I say it's hard to... Well, yeah, I feel I, I like really we're looking at an exposed wound. I feel I like this stuff is so personal. Absolutely. It's like reading somebody's yeah. diary. Yes. These scenes, not yes. the street fighting scenes, which are just cliched yeah. weird. Like, he goes and, through this... As I, I and, described and the whole... Nonsense. Like, telling, saying that like, he made some guy eat his fingers. It's like, that sounds really extreme, Yeah, but it's, it's stupid. Well, I'll tell you, the reason I describe that scene in so much detail is at the very end of the book, when he finally catches up with T-Bird, the main bad guy, T-Bird is hanging out with Shelby. So I'm like, wait a second, Shelby knew where T-Bird, they're hanging out together. They, uh, I think it's like maybe a week later or a day later, or I don't know, but he knows where that guy is and he ate his fingers and he didn't give up his location. Like, it's just a load of nonsense. The, it's like, very 80s, and doing... there's a whole there's this whole thing with this cop that's on the case. He's in like three scenes, yeah. and you're like, oh, this this guy's gonna figure into the plot, and he doesn't because he's just um he he's he figures out that Eric is alive, and he's like he knows this is the the Eric case, this guy that was murdered a year before or whatever. And then there's another scene where Eric meets this little girl named Sherry, who is the daughter of this. Uh, drug addict who's hanging out with one of the guys that he's after yeah and he kind of sits sits on the porch and talks with her the next scene we see her she's like in tears because Eric is about to die and I'm like you talked with her for five minutes on a stoop like what's this relationship yeah there is no I feel like he's pulling all this James O'Barr is pulling all this stuff that he's just seen in movies and stuff to fashion a plot which I think is not important. I think the important stuff yeah. is the diary stuff, which is him I, drawing this very grim self-harm stuff and the poetry and all I, that stuff in the apartment. Oh man, there's just so much poetry. Eric as well, when he's not telling people that he's eaten their fingers, and uh, that, that he's fed them their fingers and other edgy stuff, he's just constantly reciting things. Yes. Reciting poetry, reciting Bible. expressions. There's some, yeah, the a Bible. lot of Christian iconography in here, which I don't... And, it's not consistent. It's all over the place. Yeah. Sometimes he's literally saying Joy Division lyrics. So this is this guy's supposed to seem so unbearably cool that he stalks around in the dark, uh, reciting Joy Division lyrics, lines from the Bible, Rimbaud poetry, and just kind of like general edgy comments. And the whole thing just comes across as trying way too hard. It's hard to talk about this book because, as you say, it's really raw. My favourite bits are the bits that are done in the art style where he's plainly hallucinating. Right, yes, the dream sequences and dream stuff sequences like that. Dream yeah. sequences, I really like. Uh, there's a lot of really... Because there's because he's dreaming, he's not saying all this dumb stuff. This grab bag 
of cool sounding lines. Yeah. It's like he wants him to be V from V for <laughs> Vendetta. Except yeah. everything V says has a point. Yeah. Usually related to the letter V. I but, feel like James O'Byrne knows what the point is, maybe. Like, again, I feel like this is a very personal thing where yeah. he has some connection to these lyrics or this poem or whatever. Yes. And he feels like it has to go in there. That's fair. But and it doesn't make on. for a, a compelling read. It. It, it's a it's a big mess. Yeah. But what I like, as I said, I really like the sequences where he's dreaming, or when he has the, or when he has a flashback. Yeah. It's drawn in a, a much more. I don't, I don't particularly like the the art's all over the place, as you said. The the dream sequences are drawn in an artistic kind of almost pencil style. Yeah. There sometimes some, he's got a great wash. Sometimes. Yeah, washed. But then some sometimes, sometimes when you, especially the gangster scenes, they're drawn in a very lumpy potato yeah, way. It. They're like really grotesque in a way. That, but the crow always usually looks pretty good, and I'm like. Well, he looks a little too good. They he's maybe often, are drawn at different he's shirtless. times. <laughs> There's a lot of... He's got a very... He's got an Iggy Pop kind of body. Yeah. Yes, he does. There's a... Yeah. And along with these... So when it... An issue will end, and then we'll have a full page of Joy Division lyrics or a full page of, of poetry. And then there'll be, a, 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 I guess, a cover picture, yeah. and it'll usually be Eric. It, it's always Eric, actually. Yeah. Shirtless. Well, there's always... There's a lot of full page splashes in there, yeah. too, even mid-story. Like, he'll yeah. stop to... Oh, put Lovingly a poem draw against... Eric's musculature. Yeah. Do you know what it reminds me of? The art from Vampire the Masquerade source books. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like some of that stuff might have been maybe was drawn later because it's actually drawn pretty well. Yeah, but... um, it's the the street stuff looks like rougher. Yeah. It's very hard. anyway. We haven't actually gone through the whole story, which well, is that you've already they... you have gone through the story. No, because I have... <laughs> he goes from guy to guy. But the reason it comes out slowly is he's going through his guys. Look, do you remember me? He was killed. Him and his girlfriend were killed. They, these guys randomly, these four or five guys randomly drove by them while they were stopped on the highway because their car broke down. Eric and his girlfriend, Shelly. And they stopped and they attacked yep. them and raped her and killed her. Eric was alive for a little bit, watching it seems. Then this supernatural crow shows up and it brings him back to life to wreak revenge. Now, sometimes I feel like it seems like he's really... talking to the crow or the crow speaking to him, but that's kind it, of it. It's left pretty vague in, in, in the comic. Uh, I think the crow... The, the crow's crow telling seems him not like to look. it's not an external... I think the crow doesn't even seem external to his mind. It seems to be something that's talking to just him. I don't yes. think anyone else yes, can yes, see no, the no crow. One can see it. In fact, we get some pages where like, there's a scene where he walks in when he's about to kill Sherry's mom. i got to talk about the names in a second. Mm. When he's talking to Sherry's mom, uh, and there's a uh, junkie, the, well, the bad guy junkie's in bed with her. He's talking, the crow is on his shoulder talking to him, yeah. or he's talking to it. I can't remember if the crow actually speaks. But when we switch to kind of the junkie's point of view, fun boy, we don't see the crow on the shoulder. So some panels the crows are in, some there isn't. So yeah. it's like a thing that only he can see. Yes, that's right. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell what's going on, I think. Uh, he's, see, he's come back from the dead. Yeah. Apparently, and he's invulnerable, which sucks a lot of the tension out. He can't. Well, I think he can feel pain, which is important because that's part of that whole self harm oh, thing. Oh, yeah, because he, he harms himself, himself. With and he injects himself with morphine. He does. Like what? He's a walking corpse, apparently. Why is he? He also works out. He does work out and he dances. He dances and works out. He has a samurai sword. God knows where he got it. That he's swinging around in his old apartment. Yeah. Well, I think that was. I mean, I have questions about the way this apartment is decorated. He decorated with <laughs> Shelley before she died. Yeah. They've got like theatrical masks. Yes. Which is kind of where his own mask comes from is the theatrical mask that they decorated their apartment with yeah. but but that's such an odd interior design choice yeah. like they're not I think there's a there's something heightened going on here I mean this is not reality even that the pre-death stuff is not reality it's a fantasy about a 18 year old's perfect life and love and this kind of and the, the way this place is decorated and the life they have together and the, the joy and the constant laughs and yeah. giggles we have during all these flashbacks and all that kind of the perfect love making all that kind of stuff is very idealized mm. um, so he's come back to the grave he's from the grave he's killing these guys one by one as I said by talking to each guy and going through the chain talking. until finally so much talking yep um, I will say about the artwork, I think, like I said, I think his drawings, especially the gray wash stuff, is really good. The yeah. charcoal looking stuff is drawn charcoal, very well. That's it. I think the staging of the action is kind of messy. Now, I saw an interview with him where he said that actually he doesn't depict the violence as part of it. Like, he doesn't actually show violence occurring on panel. You see a shadow or like a silhouette or something, 
at most, or you see some blood spurting from off panel. There is one panel where he decapitates a guy on panel, which is like hilarious. Um, yeah. But I think he, because of that, like the action is kind of hard to follow. But again, to me, the gang stuff and the action stuff is not. No. It's like it's inserted in here. He said he drew it for himself and he didn't care about an audience, but but it seems like this stuff is there for an audience. It's like a, a narrative framework that doesn't need to be there. I feel like the only stuff he really cares about is the working out in the apartments. I hate to even speculate about what he was thinking sure. or feeling. All we can go is, is what's in there. And, you know, like it doesn't... It, you're right, it's it's the least interesting thing about the comic is the is the rampage of revenge. Like I said, yeah. he, the, he he can feel pain. Maybe he says something. There is degrees of death. So he's the the Eric. So he he can take damage, but it can't. Inc it seems very inconsistent about what can what happens to him when he's wounded. Yeah. Because sometimes he seems to bleed, but in the end of the book, he's shot with a cavalcade of fire. I mean, like it's like six or seven guys unload all their guns into him, and he's fine. It's not at all. And of course, he also feels the need to inject himself with drugs and to perform self-harm yeah and work out all of this is hard to reconcile with an indestructible corpse man who sometimes has the powers of invulnerability and sometimes has the powers of regeneration yeah yeah tricky i as you say i what's going on i don't really know maybe it's all a hallucination i don't think it really matters uh it, it's a bit frustrating trying to figure out what Yes. The limits. Uh, what are the limits of his abilities? Why yeah. is he there? Yeah. How did he come back from the grave? None of it's addressed. No, because it, as you said, it starts in Meteor's rest, so we don't get like rising from the grave nope. or anything like that. Nope. Um, he's just there, and then he we slowly piece it. We don't see this the crime happen until more than halfway through the book. And the crime is so over the top too, as you said. They, they they haul them out of their car, which is crashed on the side of the road. They shoot him twice, once in the back of the head, but he doesn't die. Instead, he's paralyzed, sort of face down in the mud, yeah. or, or slightly with his face slightly turned to the side. And it's made, the, the bird keeps saying, don't look, don't look, but he can't not look because he's paralyzed. And then he watches his fiance horribly raped and murdered by these monsters. And I think, like I said, I don't know what is going on, but it... it as you say, it feels very raw. Like an open... It's like a scream put down on page, it feels like, mm. sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think he's trying to come up with the most horrifying instance of human suffering he could think of. And such as the power of Eric's grief, the intensity of it, the death itself couldn't yeah. dissipate it. The grief and, is very intense. And that's what brings say. him back... Yeah. Kind of from the grave. Yeah. The engine of his unbearable grief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the death itself. You re can't I really away. I really felt the intensity of the grief because there are a lot there's a lot of time spent in that apart apartment with him alone meditating on it or dwelling on it. Mm. Um, I think part of the overtopness also part of the problem with these gangsters is they're all really, really different. They don't seem like five guys that would hang out together. <laughs> and one of them, even T Bird is like extreme. Like he has sex with a corpse. Right, with her corpse. And I'm like, I don't know that the other gang members would be okay with that and still hang out with this guy yeah. after he did that. Yeah, people generally They're just don't like, oh man, you crazy. Like yeah. And I'm like, no, this is... And he's even the most bad guys, Even bad guys have limits. They would be like, I'm not going to hang out with this necrophile anymore. Necrophile. There's a freaking bizarre thing, because he's the most, how you say, sympathetically presented of the gangsters, the necrophile. Because I would say actually the drug guy is the most, because he... the same. No, okay. no, because Fun Boy... Isn't it Fun Boy? No, no, no. Fun Boy is the guy that's a real addict, and the crow allows him to kill himself by ODing. Yeah, that's Fun Boy, right? Yeah, that's not T-Bird. He's the only one T-Bird is the guy at the... No, T-Bird's the guy at the... No, he beats T-Bird to death with a hammer. He's the very last yeah. boss. He's the final boss. Yeah. Fun Boy... I think... He, Fun, he, Fun Boy led him to T-Bird and told T-Bird... Uh, sorry. And told Fun Boy, tell T-Bird to go meet me out on the highway where that thing happened a year and ago. And he does it. And then, so weird. And then T-Bird refuses and Fun Boy says, well, I tried. And he's like, okay, well, you, I'll let you kill yourself. Now... Funboy seems to admit that he's evil, unlike some of the other characters. Yeah, Funboy... And he's allowed a more merciful death that's than right. any of the others. That's, why I mean, that's what I mean when I say he seems to be presented sympathetically. He's yes. the only one that's introspective. Yes. He, he sort of concludes that he doesn't know why he does what he does, and he doesn't have the capacity to feel bad about it. Yeah. He just does it. Well... It's interesting, too, because the first guy, or the second guy, Tintin, is, uh, he's a headband dude. Yeah. And uh, he, we get a, a narrative caption that tells us his soul was so twisted with evil. 
And I'm like, well, that's very black and white. And there is a lot of these bad guys, let's say, it, are ethnic stereotypes, most of them. Yeah. That's um, another problem. And they're all very, as I said, they're all very mismatched. They don't seem like they would be. It's like the cast of Friends. Like, why are these people friends? <laughs> why are these guys hanging out? They don't seem like they're in the same gang. But just to say that he's evil without any real under. There's no. Again, it's hard to criticize the book because the book is supposed to be one thing. It's supposed to be revenge. It's supposed to be a single-minded shriek of grief from the darkness. So it's hard to say, well, you haven't considered this guy's economic, socioeconomic circumstances <laughs> and how he ended up in this position where he's living on the street stabbing people. Like, we don't know Tintin's story. We just get a line that says his soul was twisted with evil. Yeah, that's right. And I don't know whether... I mean, I want to criticize it. I it want to say this is right. bad writing, but it doesn't feel right to criticize it. <laughs> Just, uh, we can only really say if we like it or not, I suppose, which we don't have to do right now, but we can yeah. do a little later. Uh, I don't have much else to say. As you say, sure, it's Eric sometimes is a complete jerk. Yeah, oh well, yeah, there, I do like that it's not black and white with him. I mean, there's no... The book isn't saying this is the right thing, the right thing he's doing. You know what I mean? It's like... I don't know. He does do some... He does do what we might describe as virtue signaling. <laughs> he... When yeah. he burns down the... Uh, you know, when he burns down the, the the pawn shop, he calls the fire brigade. Oh, Why but, does the walking corpse care about the fire brigade? Well, why but, does he blow... He blows the pawn shop with the 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 dealer in there, the yeah. manager. That guy's not even... He's not guilty of anything. So no. he bought those... Aside from Blood buying, rings. He yeah. bought... It's like from buying stolen goods. Yeah. That's his crime. Is that do you deserve to be immolated? But then, after he's immolated the man in his own pawn shop, he calls the fire brigade. Yeah. Why? Why? He's Why worried are you about the other buildings corpse? in the neighborhood. Why do you care about the? <laughs> you know. Also, you know, he's he's he he talks to Shirley, Sherry's mum. You know, he tells yeah. her mother is the word for God for children. Yeah. You know, you need to go home and look after your kid. Yeah. Why does he care? The only thing, he's a single-minded revenge monster that cuts himself and injects himself with morphine and dances yeah. in his apartment. By the way, I don't like that there are three characters named Shelby, Shelley, and Sherry, mm. and T-Bird, Tintin. Uh, there's like two top, other... Top dollar. Top, top dollar. There's like three T bad guys. But again, how, how do you criticize something like this? Yeah. How do you criticize his therapy notes? Yeah. That, that have um, been printed and published. Oh, another. I had another note about the cop. Is he, when he calls, what is he, he calls, okay, so, he, so I think Eric actually lived, he lived past, the, like, when the girlfriend died, he survived, he was in the hospital. You're right, because he, And the he cop was calls and yeah. said, yeah, I'm Captain Cook, Captain Hook, ha ha. This is a line of dialogue <laughs> in this comic. Like, there's a bit of, like, cliched 80s cop stuff in here. Hmm. Um, that's just like in there without any filter from James O'Barr. It's like he picked this stuff up from 80s cop movies yeah. and he's put it in there. Like the cop makes a joke uh, as he's talking to this guy on his deathbed. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can't critique it. We can only... Yeah. yeah, yeah. We can only, as I said, yeah. decide whether or not we enjoyed it. Uh, but we can critique the film. Okay. <laughs> so... Again, this is very hard to talk about because well, you, oh, you've got all point. these associations in your mind about the movie. Because of because the... Brandon Lee was shot on set. That's right. In the scene in which he dies. That's right. That's and they right. the scenes they had to. So this is 1994. I saw this movie once in 1994 at the cinema. So I, this is my first time watching it in 30 years. Yep. It was last night or the night before. And my memory from when they reconstructed it, you know, they're like, well, it's finished the film. The stuff that hadn't been finished was mostly stuff of him coming out of the grave. Yes. So the, the scene of him walking down the alley and the scene of him looking out the loft window was done with a... They CG, they masked his face over another actor. They did. In so he first... came back from the grave, much as Eric came back from the grave. <laughs> Three days before completion, sure. he was about to get married after shooting completed he three was. days later. Yes. Much as Eric was about to marry his fiance the day before he's killed. Not to mention James O'Barr himself, who was... And James O'Barr, who became best friends with Brandon, with Brandon Lee. Lee. I know. And then Brandon... Lee. So... And James O'Barr is on record as saying he... Well, I understand he's since reconciled himself to his work, but in the aftermath of the film, he was on record as saying that he wished he'd never written it because yeah. then his friend... He gave away cut. all the money from it to charity, apparently. He bought a stereo system and a car for his mum. He okay. gave the rest away because he felt like it was blood money. Yeah. This poor guy. Yeah, I just want to give him a hug. Yeah. So, again, I mean, I want to think... I tried... Okay, it's been 30 years. I said, oh, I'm going to be able to look at this movie, um, like, objectively. No! 
I went in there, I was still like, oh, this is the scene. I still remember the scene was added in after he died and yeah. all the stuff still swirling around in my head as I'm watching it. Anyway, right. written by David Shaw, who is a splatterpunk author. I yes. don't know how he got this movie writing gig. He writ he's written well, a couple he, of Tex Chainsaws as well. He's uh, script doctored it, okay. apparently. That's why he gets that credit. Apparently, the it was mostly written by one of the producers, John... Sh no, no. Uh, one of the producers called Jeff Most. Okay. But he, the rules at the time were that a producer couldn't have a writing credit oh. on a film. Bizarre. Okay. Yeah. For whatever reason. So, the uh, credit... He doesn't get a credit on the film, though he attests in interviews that he did quite a lot of it. Okay. And that Shao was brought in to kind of clean it up and, and uh, kind of put some... Insert some horror tropes. Right. Okay. <laughs> and, gotcha. and some things like that. Gotcha. To make it a bit more... Uh, a, a sort of a tighter, more kind of horror narrative. Right. Okay. Directed by Alex Proyas. Australian director. His first feature. Well, he did some sort of Australian post-apocalyptic sci-fi thing in 88. I didn't know that. Called Spirits of the Air. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I know that he did uh, music videos primarily. He did music videos and he did that. I don't know. That must be some low budget thing. I don't know what it is. I've never seen it. Yeah. I've never even heard of it. Crow in 94, Dark City in 1980. That's a... 98, which is as good as it gets. Yeah. Um, you can see a lot of seeds of Dark City in this Absolutely movie. Absolutely, you can. Uh, then suddenly we get iRobot in 2004, Knowing in 2009, and Gods of Egypt in 2016, and it's like... It was a, it's like a plane crash, a, and you can see it going down. A precipitous fall. Some high what heights happened? and some low lows. What happened? Yeah. Real question. Uh, it seemed like he was going to be something else after Dark City. Uh, Brandon Lee had done a bunch of B-movies at the stage in Legacy of Rage, Laser Mission. Showed in Little Tokyo, which, as I recall, isn't bad. It's got... Um, uh, what's his name? The Punisher and... Uh, Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren in it. Mm. Mm. And um, Rapid Fire with Powers Booth from in 92, which I saw in the last two or three years for the first time, and it's not bad. It's pretty good. And Brandon Lee is really interesting in that. I don't know if it was his choice, but I think he kills two or three people in the course of the whole movie, but he's really upset about it. Every time it happens. <laughs> and any time he gets a gun, he immediately throws it away. He's like, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Not like in this film. No. Um, really interesting thing. Now, we get to The Crow in 94, and to me, I'm like, how did this... How did this get made? How did it get made? Because to me, this looks... I feel like this is... It plays like an 80s revenge movie. Yes. It feels like... In a sense, it's like the comic. It's like... Like, there's nothing really special going on. I feel like maybe Proyas made the most of the budget somehow. Absolutely. And really stretched it and was really creative and somehow Brandon Lee was just in this moment that he was able to make this kind of special movie out of this thing that was supposed to be another Shodan in Little Tokyo or another rapid fire, not really supposed to be a big important thing. I, I'm curious to know if you know what the budget of it is. Twenty three million. That's pretty high. Like, I was expecting it to be... Film. Yeah. It's not a big I thought it was going to be like a 10, 5, 10 million dollar... He did stretch it, and he, right. part of the reason... Part of the, stre the stretching is part of the reason really why Brandon Lee died the way... Because right. they were cutting corners. But we'll get to that when I talk okay. about his death. Uh, but yes, um, how did this film get made? It, it is... It's. It was a... Paramount, it was produced by Paramount, so, you know, a major motion picture company. Yeah. With a major well, Rapid Fire budget. was two, and in fact, when yeah. I watched Rapid Fire, I wanted to just mention, so I think it was Paramount, I was shocked when I watched this movie three years ago, because there were no other production companies in the opening credits. It was just like a studio picture, like came right out of yeah. the center of the studio. It wasn't like we're going to split costs with five other houses or whatever. It was, uh, it was unthinkable. But anyway, go on. Well, I mean, there's not too much to tell about how this got made. You can sum it up in one word, which is Batman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I guess that. I was of saying course. leather outfit. I was like, okay, this is Batman. Yeah. So, um, and uh, Jeff Most and John Shirley, who were the producers, Jeff Most, who wrote the script, were behind it, essentially. They, they were the ones that shopped it around. Okay. Uh, I've got a quote from Jeff Most. He says, it was 1989 and Batman had just come out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, so the comic comes out the same year. Yeah. Right, okay. Yes. And they hit... It, John Shirley, the other producer, says, the tone of it was something I had an instant affinity for. I'm a goth kind of guy. Yep. My favourite superheroes are weird and dark, like Batman and the Creeper. I responded to the rock and roll iconography that was present. There were okay. images of the hero that were very much inspired by photos of Iggy Pop on stage. Yeah, also Peter so Murphy of Bauhaus... 
is another big one I'd say here. Um, definitely, uh, what's his name from The Cure? Uh, yes. The Smith, Smith, uh, Robert, Pl Robert, Robert Smith. Robert Smith, that's it. Actually, you know, the same year, Neil Gaiman's Sandman came out. Had a yeah. very similar visual that's styling. Thing. Yes, that's right. It does with make the me think of Sandman, actually, and with the, white the hair, face. the white face, and the black clothing. Yeah. Which was how Neil Gaiman dressed at the time, and still dresses, really. Yeah. Um, so okay. It's, and you picked up on the Iggy Pop thing. Uh, according to a bar, Fun Boy is completely modelled on right. Iggy Pop. Right. I mean, he has the same physique, he has the same long hair, even suffered the same facial features. And they wanted Iggy Pop... To play to, yeah. Fun Boy or The Crow? Fun Boy. Okay. He was asked to be in the film, but he declined because of scheduling conflicts. Oh. He does appear in the sequel, though. Which I... Yes, that's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which I think makes this... That would make that his third film, making him a comic book movie oblivion also. Yes, yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. He's, he's a potential one Thomas right Jane now. is in it as well, by the way. Oh, the amazing. one after this one. That's incredible. <laughs> so, uh, apparently New Line offered James O'Barr a certain amount of money... Okay. ...to purchase the rights from him... In a lump sum, in perpetuity. Okay. He was working in a garage at the time. Yeah. He turned them down because there he would have no creative input oh, and okay. no control over what happened eventually. And even though it would have, it, apparently it was good money, he turned it down for that reason because it's something clearly he feels very emotionally involved yeah, in. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, and so that's how um, most and Shirley were able to kind of get him in their corner because they said he would be involved. Right. Okay. Interesting because New Line, you know, three, four years later would come out with Blade... Yes. Which is kind of in the same vibe region. It really I, is. is. That's the way I, to express it. I completely agree, actually. And you might remember, I talked a little bit about Blade as a trailblazer for leather-clad secret undead, magic. Undead leather-clad, yeah. Leather-clad heroes with, a, with, a conspiracy, with conspiracies and gun fu and kung fu. And wow, it looks like Blade was not the first film of this type, as we will get into. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so we get some very sparse title cards. Yeah. Brandon Lee's name is above the title. Yep. Of course, then we get this cityscape, which is kind of abstract and fantastical. It's very clearly like models or whatever, but it looks like what Dark City is going to look yes, like. Yes, it does look very much like Dark City. <laughs> we get a bit of narration from a little girl telling us about crows who bring people back from the dead if their death is really bad. So straight right from the gate, we have an explanation yes. for what's happening. Then, unlike the comic, also we start with the death. We start with the crime scene. That's right. And Ernie Hudson is our head cop, <laughs> uh, which was a surprise I'd forgotten he was in it and in it a lot he's, he's not lot. like Captain Hook in the comic he no. is in this movie um, so they were going to get married on Halloween night. So this is the night before Halloween. This is uh, Devil's Night in Detroit, which yeah. is, was a real phenomenon from the late 60s through to the early 1990s. Okay. Where uh, criminals would set fires in Detroit on the night before Halloween. Okay. I did not know that. Uh, yeah. Like hundreds of fires okay. every year. Right. Eventually, the city put a lot of money in not just fighting the fires, but also promoting something called Angels Night, mm -hmm. uh, providing funding and support to community groups that would patrol their neighborhoods okay. to prevent people from setting fires. Um, so this attack happened in their loft apartment. So it's not didn't happen out on a highway. It wasn't that. No. It wasn't random, which we got to talk about later <laughs> on. Yes. It seems like a oh. bunch of guys just charging the apartment, and we get a bit of like flashbacky kind of like flash cuts. I can sort of see Proyas's background as a music video director. Yeah. Because it feels. Oh, there's a lot of Dutch tilt going on. So much Some Dutch weird tilt. coloring, like uh, bright yeah. reds. Yeah. Bright red backlights, Dutch angles, a lot of um, shooting upwards, like Hitchcock angles. Yeah. Up at, shooting up at people's yeah. faces yeah. and camera moving around, like swooping camera work. Yeah. Those sequences that you mentioned where we're seeing Detroit, except it's a fantastical, almost uh, nightmarish version of yeah. Detroit, also feels kind of music. I don't even think the city's named in the movie, is it? Oh, well, but the fact that it's Devil's Night shows that it's Detroit. Yes, but I didn't know that. Oh, okay. So for me, I, it was just some fantasy city. Could be. Yeah, that's fair enough. And we're often following a, a, uh, a crow. As it flies yeah. about, it feels very stylized. Yes. Very much like. Heightened and stylized, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, as we're leaving the crime scene with um, the woman is still alive in yes. this case, Eric is dead. He fell at the window. He was shot, fell well, at he was the thrown window. thrown out the window. Yeah, that's right. right. We meet this girl, Sarah, who is apparently like babysat by them sometimes. Now, this is the equivalent of Sherry in the comic, but that's she's right. introduced right in the opening scenes. Yes. 
right off the bat. And she's been renamed to Sarah to avoid Thank God, the yes. name <laughs> trap yeah. that you mentioned. And it. I don't think Ernie Hudson is called Captain Hook. He's not the captain anyway. I don't know. No, remember. he's called, I think, Ulbricht. Ulbricht. Right, okay. So we cut to a year later. Uh, a crow arrives at the grave. He literally crawls out of it. Yeah. Um, and this is not um, this is not Brandon Lee, as you pointed out. This is his stunt double. Yeah. Right. Whose name is Chad Stahelski. Okay. A name that might be familiar to fans of the John Wick series of movies because he's the director. Oh. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I wonder... Never mind. There's a long connect the dots here with the fact that Mark Dacascos is in John Wick 3, but it doesn't. that doesn't matter. <laughs> Erase that from your memories. That's fine. So, yeah, this is all him. It's done... It's pretty good. I mean, it, it kind of makes thematic sense that we don't see his face because he hasn't put the makeup on yet. Uh, we do see it a little bit when he's coming down the aisle. But there'll be some... at the time, this is 1994... This is only a few years after T2 and Jurassic Park. This is very expensive to put CG effects on screen it and costs, to do this. Yes, yes. Would have been very difficult, and they're very sparing it, with it. They only do it a couple of times. It added um, several million dollars to the budget. Yeah, absolutely. That was provided by Miramax, I believe, right. after Paramount dropped it because of the controversy oh, surrounding right. okay. Brandon Lee's death. Oh, so it, it took the Weinsteins to it step in. And very unfortunately, yes, it was the Weinsteins <laughs> that were responsible for this film getting made, pretty much. Okay, so he arrives, the, the corpse arrives in his apartment. Uh, he reenacts the crimes, like he mimes them. Yeah. Sort of. Like he, we see flashes to the crimes and we see him kind of dancing around. This scene is actually the most like the comic in terms of the yeah, level of worried. grief he's feeling and him the way he's moving around in his. We get some, as you say, sometimes he's a digital composite, but it's very, uh, it's not very often, I think. It's done quite yeah. subtly. Yeah. Uh, say, which when he's looking at his reflection briefly, you can you can tell, mm. but they've done it cleverly because we're not seeing him front on. Yeah. Through a camera lens, we're seeing him in a reflection. There are also some, some splicing from obviously other scenes, yeah. I would say, or other sets or other settings mm -hmm. where they we, we see Brandon Lee for not really long enough for a proper take. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's it's clearly been spliced in quickly so that we can't see the background so we right. don't know that he's not in the same place as a stunt up. Right. But very, I think if you weren't alerted to it, you wouldn't. I was watching for it. I think if you didn't know about it, you wouldn't really. No, notice. I didn't even. I was expecting some 1994 CGI here and I really didn't get it. The scene where he's looking out of the loft, the broken window, that circle, looks great. I thought it looked great at the time. It still looks great and it's not him. It's his face mapped That's onto right. another actor. It looks pretty good. By the way, Brandon Lee is, looks really good in this yeah. movie. He he's, looks so he's good. He's in excellent shape. Uh, yeah. he, he stayed in shape the whole film. He lost 20 pounds for the role right. to play this, I suppose... Anemic corpse? Skeletal corpse. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, gee, he worked hard, apparently. Turning down food. Wow. Uh, and struggling. Um, like, uh, often stripped to the waist. They're always shooting at night. Yeah. Which, of course, has its own issues. And they often had a rain machine going, so he was freezing. Right. Not an ounce of fat on him. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. really suffered for his art in more than one sense. Yeah. Uh, now we get to see the, the guys that broke into the apartment. They're, mm -hmm. they're playing this drinking game where they're swallowing bullets for some reason. Very silly. It's really over the top. To, uh, yeah, very over the top. Stuff. And then we see the head bad guy, and he's like got this crazy... It's played by Michael Wincott, who's a Canadian actor. He's yes. also he will shoot, we'll see him again. Ghost in the Shell. Yeah. Um. I always remember him from because he's got a very distinctive face. I remember him from Alien Resurrection, yes. which I've only seen probably twice. But You've got I'm a like, very distinctive face and and a, a, an amazing gravelly voice. Yes. Which sees him cast in these roles a lot. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, his voice is so gravelly, I think it's proto mumblecore. Because I had a lot of trouble <laughs> figuring out the plot of this movie or what his grand scheme was, because he was mumbling his way through it. Yeah. He's got this, well, this crazy girlfriend that he claims is a sister. They've got a dead girl in his bed yeah. who she's like keen to carve out her eyeball, and yeah. she does. Well, she does. It. They keep that eyeball. For the next scene, it's like she's broiling it or something. They have both eyeballs. They, they, bur they burn one. I think it's to establish that she's a bit witchy herself. Yeah. There's some magic going on there. It's pretty understated, but she's the one that figures out the connection with she the She does, but we don't see any actual magical... You don't know that Wincott, who actually is not playing T-Bird, he's playing Top Dollar. Yes. They've swapped the names around for some reason, but he's... Um, 
Oh, I know what they swap. But anyway, he they swap the names, but he there doesn't he doesn't seem we don't know if he believes in that she's doing actual magic. No, he's, he's like, take that, I'm sure he lets her boil the eyeballs it's and stuff. Very it's very his character's not very well developed. He's got a vault full of swords. <laughs> And yet later on, when the the when the crow attacks the whole gang, the vault's open. I'm like, why? Why is why is it in a vault if you're gonna leave it open? Close the vault. So uh, the half sister. But again, these are all very. This is very like I don't know, 80s ish, 90s ish bad guys. It's a bit like the comic, and that there are all these randos. Tony Todd is one of them. He actually looks yeah. like yeah. there is a character in the comic that looks like this guy, like this guy, black guy in a suit with a goatee, and Tony Todd looks like that guy. But it's like, what's he doing in either of these? I think he fits in this world a bit more than in the world of the comic, yeah. where they're in these dingy apartments. Here he's in this like very fancy place on top of this nightclub called what was it called? I can't remember. Cr crash or Shaft or something like that. <laughs> trash, <laughs> trash maybe. Trash. Yeah. So top dollar in this is a crime boss yeah uh, and tony todd is his like his major domo kind his of major domo yeah. yeah excellent excellent his mate his chief henchman yeah and of course he has his crazy half sister whose main job is to lounge all over him wearing over sexualized outfits she's always like laying on tables and she never sits in a chair that's she's played by bai ling yeah uh who i associate with over sexualized roles right and crazy kind of like scanty outfits. Okay. Hilariously, she showed up for her audition, audition wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Huh. <laughs> I've got a quote from her. I think the first shot we get of her is her butt in the shower. That's right, it is, yeah. yeah. She says, I, uh, I did not really speak English at the time. I was brought in for the audition and when I went in, everyone, presumably all the other <laughs> actresses, had nose rings or black lips. Huh. And they all looked so weird to me. Huh. They all had really heavy eye makeup and I was wearing jeans and a white t-shirt. Hmm. I just looked like a student. I thought I had walked into the wrong place. Hmm. I find that quite funny considering her later kind of reputation, I suppose. Right. Also, she, uh, like many people, made friends with Brandon Lee. Okay. Nobody has a bad thing to say about Brandon Lee. Of course, Lee. yeah. Uh, of course, but also the people talk about him. I read a, an article online, an oral history, similar to the one I read for Blade, called Shadow's Wing, Legacy of the Crow. It's a series of interviews with a lot of people who worked on the film, including Tony Todd and Ernie Hudson. Uh, and nobody has a bad thing to say about Brandon. Everybody talks about him the way they people talk about Keanu Reeves. Right. So just that he's just an incredibly kind, generous, thoughtful yep. person. Yeah. <laughs> Such yep. a tragedy. Ernie Hudson, he made friends with Ernie Hudson. Yeah. In fact, apparently Ernie Hudson got the role because Brandon Lee wanted him. Brandon, Brandon Lee had a kind of like an outsized role in determining kind of like the, right. the, the, the way this film eventually ended up being made. Uh, Ernie Hudson, I've got a quote from the article. I really wanted to work with Alex Proyas. I met with him and we talked about the script. He told me that Brandon wanted me to play Albrecht, which I was very honoured and flattered by. I wasn't familiar with the comic, but I liked Brandon and I loved Alex's reel. I thought it was a very dark and interesting project. When I got there, I met James O'Barr and we became friends too. So it was as if it was meant to be from the start. Wow. When Ernie Hudson's wife's brother died, they had to fly out. And before they did though, Brandon Lee took them to dinner. Huh. You know, to essentially comfort them, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, right. This would be someone he'd never met. Yeah. Just such a shame. A real tragedy. Yeah. Anyway, the reason I got started on this was um, Bai Ling also made friends with him. And he, Brandon, told her, oh, my dad's Bruce Lee. She said, who's that? <laughs> wow. And he's like, what? What do you mean, who's that? He, You know, Bruce Lee. He did these, he's a Chinese actor, he did these such and such and such and such films. She's like, don't know, sorry. Then apparently she telephoned her friend in New York, who was bilingual, and um, she said, oh, he means Li Xiaolong. Oh, <laughs> and of gosh. course she instantly knew, of course, he's right. the biggest yeah, right. martial arts star in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Funny little story. Funny. Okay, so after he's gone to the apartment, he puts on his makeup. They have the theatrical masks in the apartment. And I would say there are scenes, flashback scenes to him and his fiance eric and shelly mm. that are also like the comic they're unrealistic there's the scene where he proposes i think they go up in the attic it's full of candles <laughs> yeah. like just covered in candles and um there are, by the way the apartment's still got like their stuff in it i'm not sure why that's the case again I, it's it's it's, it's we're it's, not quite in the okay. real world here. this isn't quite like blade runner 2049 where decades a flat was a crime scene for 10 years in this case it's been one year and it's in detroit where there are very many abandoned buildings 
Sure, but don't you think uh, like squatters or someone would strip the place? I don't know. I'm suspending he finds, disbelief. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, sure. So like the master, the theatrical master there, and he models, he looks so good in the chrome makeup. Yeah, he looks so. He really does look amazing. He looks so good. Okay, so the thing that happens in this movie is the crow leads Eric to each victim. That's he doesn't right. beat them up to say where's the next guy. No. The crow flies. He fall. He leaps across the it's rooftops. Much more overtly supernatural. Yeah. 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 He leaps across the rooftops. Falls the crow. The crow leads him to some bad guy. He has flashes. He remembers that guy. He kills that guy. So he kills Tintin first. Mm -hmm. Uh. Almost like he does in the comic. He doesn't. He, there's no Jones type in here. I don't think. And we get we find out what his powers are because he cuts his hands. I think when he's still in his old flat. Yeah. And he watches them heal in front of him, Wolverine stuff. Yeah. And then he's uh, Tim Tim is a, a knife fighter. Yeah. Incidentally, everyone in this film gets karmic deaths. Yes. Fine. Again, these are tropes. Tropes aren't bad. Yep. So. Uh, Tintin stabbed his wife. Yes. So now he's And he being... throws, he like throws spinning knives at, at uh, the crow. And the crow's just dodging him all. Dodge catches bats, one. Bats one away at some point. Yeah, I wonder how effective a spinning dagger is anyway. You feel like it wouldn't go in that deep after it's lost that much kinetic energy. Anyway, they, when they find him dead, he's been, st he's stabbed full, like yeah. just like a pincushion. Someone says he got, he's, he's got, all his internal organs were stabbed in alphabetical order, I think is a line. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, go on. He's actually, why did I write the word drool in my notes? I think the crow, I think Brandon actually drools in one scene. <laughs> I don't it's remember like that. In a close up and it's actually really good. Like, it's cool. Um, so now we get a scene with the pawn shop where he goes in for the ring, as yeah. before. Importantly, does not kill the guy. No. Who is played by, this guy he's was also John in the, Polito. He's in the Rocketeer. Yeah, he was, he played Otis He's been a hundred things. Yeah. Um, but he's of chief interest to us. For, this is his second appearance yeah. in the podcast. Yeah, maybe last. I think I'm not so. sure. A lot of these guys that I find now, I go in there on Wikipedia, and they're in like a hundred. They've done voices in a hundred DC cartoons. Ah, uh, yes, but they have to be. They the have film. to be on the show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They have to be on the show. Yes. Um. Yeah. So we're in the pawn shop. We're in the pawn shop. It plays out a little. He goes through the rings. He finds the ring, the engagement ring that he gives. Still treats this pawn guy. Uh, Gideon is his name. Yeah. It's a bit rough on him. He's yeah. rough, but he survives it. He's completely sleazy. This he lives enough guy. to actually go to to Top Dollar, the yeah. Michael Wincott character, yeah. and tell him that he was attacked and what happened exactly. Yeah. There's a really cool sequence. Uh, so, as in the comic, Eric is there to recover his engagement ring, which luckily is still in the pawn shop and hasn't been sold over the last year. Yes, and actually, um, Tint was it Tintin that come in? No, yeah. somebody else came in. Sure it was Tintin. It was Tintin that came Tintin, in. Uh, is, oh, so that's right. He, he came in is before. And he's, yeah. So again, he's right. a fence. Yeah. But I mean, did he deserve to die? I don't know. Uh, but you know, like, Eric is pretty rough on him, considering he's not involved in the murder of well, his wife. Well, he at least he gives a line, which is that this is these are all blood money. Like That's you, right. he knows it. In this case, he's not just a fence. He knows that Tintin kills people and takes her jewelry, right. and he's taking jewelry from dead people. So it's not just stolen. Fair enough. And he doesn't kill him, as you said. It's very explicit. He just sort of really roughs him up. He, he blows up the place as he does in the comic. In an amazing. And he's just blasted it. He could have died in the blast, but he is just kind of blown away against the he back sort of stabs alley wall. Him through his hand with a knife as well. Yeah. But this is after Gideon has tried to kill him too. He shot him in the head, and of course it has no effect. Yeah. And then he shot him in the chest, and we watch it visibly heal. Uh, there's a really cool effect where Eric picks up some of the rings, which don't. He's recovered his ring, and but there's a whole bunch of other rings, and he has a pump-action shotgun, which he then drops the rings into the muzzle of, yeah, into the barrel of, and then he spills gasoline everywhere, and then he fires the shotgun full of rings, yeah. very dangerous, uh, into the uh, pawn shop, which ignites the gasoline and causes the big fireball. And the shot of the rings coming out of the shotgun looks really good. Yeah. Which yeah. I think they did by um, dropping them into it and then doing it in reverse. Ah, gotcha. Okay. So, um, we get back to, oh, we do get the stuff with T-Bird. I think T-Bird is the one with the drugged up girlfriend who is Sarah's mom. Oh, was somebody no, else? That's fun still fun boy. Still fun boy. Okay. And he's an addict. I wrote down something about T-Bird's girlfriend. I don't remember what my note was. Anyway, there's a hilarious scene here with, uh, Top Dollar in his office. Every yeah. time we cut back, I think this might be the scene where we first see the swords. Yes. But he's got this, this plate of cocaine, which is the biggest 
pile. It's like the mountain of mashed potatoes from Close Encounters. Yeah, it is a, a giant of mound of cocaine. It's not he's quite like, as much cocaine. He's like cutting it into lines. He's just like snorting. It's not quite as much cocaine as on Tony Montana's desk in Scarface. Yes. But it very it's, nearly it, is. It, it, it's like <laughs> ridiculous. Meanwhile, she's like, Bai Ling is boiling the eyeball. Yeah. Right next to him, next to this giant play of cocaine, it is bizarre. It's this really movie is weird. That's right. It feels like a live-action Vampire the Masquerade movie. <laughs> yeah. Without any vampire, everyone kind of acts like a character from Vampire the Masquerade. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is the scene with Gideon, I think, right? And uh, so yes. Gideon, incidentally, has is one brave dude. So he's just been stabbed through the hand. He's drinking whiskey or something in a bar, numbing the pain, I guess. Then Tony Todd shows up, drags him off. And he's just, like, really rude to everybody. Yeah. This guy, you'd think he would be in terror of his life. He's meeting the biggest crime lord in the city, who's a certified nutcase, sleeping with his half-sister and boiling eyeballs, and doing mountains of cocaine right in front of him. And he's just, like, flipping him off yeah. and swearing yeah. at him and calling him names. Gee, he's got some brass balls, this guy. Doesn't do him any good, though, because Top Dollar grabs the sword out of his sword vault. And uh, even after he gives up the information, he stabs him through the neck with Is it. this a scene where uh, Top Dollar mumbles his plans about tenant eviction in that building? There's a whole plot here about how they were trying to evict Eric and Shelley from the apartment. She put up, she was making a protest. She actually comes, was, yeah. uh, she had a, she was like getting signatures uh, to protest this. And for some reason they, because they refused to get out, this is the reason they were specifically targeted. Uh, Okay, but what right. was the plot here? Well, it's it's this plot is pretty formulaic, and I think most of it's revealed through Albrecht, the cop, okay, Ernie Hudson's character. So he's he sees the crow after he shoots up the pawn shop. Yeah, right. He sees Eric, and Eric speaks to him. Basically, plays upon their shared past mm -hmm. because. Eric was the one who found... Uh, sorry, Albrecht was the one who found Eric after he fell out the window. And um, he... Ernie Hudson... Albrecht recognises him. And then he goes away and starts digging. And I think that's how we find out about the, the whole thing with the Tenants Association. So somebody... Criminal Elements wanted to evict everyone from that building. What, to leave it alone for a year? Because <laughs> that's what apparently happens. With all its possessions still inside it. And... But it's connected to the fires as well that they're starting Oh yeah, night. that comes later on. But there's some connection. You, I Maybe. Think? It's hard to, It's very vague. It, it's very paper thin. Okay. We get to see... Somehow they're profiting off the fires. I don't know how. Okay. We just find that out later. Yeah. When Top Dollar meets with his capos, you know, mm -hmm. his, 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 his top henchmen, you know, like, and he's talking about how they're going to set the fires and make money, and I don't understand how setting fires makes you money. Yeah. Whatever. But we know from Ulrich's investigation into the into the circumstances of Eric and Shelley's death that Shelley was the head of a tenants association that was resisting the efforts of the local toughs, mm -hmm. the local standover men or whatever to evict them from the building. And that's why they were the target of the gang that night. Yeah. Then at the end of the film, like, spoilers, we've already said it doesn't matter, it's revealed that Top Dollar was the one that sent them. So right, because is, he's, there's... Yeah. So in case we were wondering, I was off... I, to be frank, I was wondering what the hell Top Dollar was doing in the movie. <laughs> I mean, he was clearly the big bad. Yeah. Because he was in charge of the gang yes. that... But he wasn't there at the apartment. No, he so wasn't. So when Eric comes back from the grave and he kills those four or five people, he doesn't need to kill Top Dollar. No, he doesn't. In fact, he's ready to go back to the grave. He's ready yes. to die that, until Sarah's kidnapped. And he's like, oh, I got to go rescue Sarah. I actually think it's, I think it's handled okay from a storytelling perspective. But we'll get to that. We'll talk about that when we get to All it. Right. But, um, okay, so I mentioned that uh, Gideon, the pawn shop owner, is stabbed through the neck with a sword. The sword might be familiar. It is the same sword from The Princess Bride. You mean the literal prop? The same prop. Wow. The sword, the six-fingered sword. The one okay. that belongs to the six-fingered man. Yeah. That Inigo Montoya is hunting. Yeah. Apparently, the very same prop, apparently. Right, okay. Um, so, yeah, so after Ernie Hudson meets the crow on the street, he's, like, kind of believing it. There's a scene in his apart in his off his cop office where he's it's that cliche thing where he has a picture of Eric and he's drawing the makeup on the makeup him and he's on. like uh you know it's okay yeah it's all I, I agree it's okay and in fact I think it's like we're functioning on a level of cliche here yeah in a lot of aspects much like the comic was so in a sense it was not like unprepared for he's going to do this cliche thing where he draws the makeup on the photo or whatever what I loved was when the crow shows up at his apartment, yeah. and he believes him. He's just yeah. like, oh, yeah, you came back from the grave. I said, are you dead? You're back. I know you're a ghost. This is like a... 
He's 40 right, minutes into the movie, yeah. in an hour, 40 minute movie, we didn't have to wait for the last scene for him to finally be convinced. Like, he's like, immediately, he's like, okay, you're a ghost. Well, first, he asks him, are you some kind of ghost? Yeah. Which is a cool line. But after that, it's not like, he's not going well, around he, telling people I don't believe it. He busts ghosts, doesn't he? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I did think of that the whole time watching this movie. <laughs> yes, that's fantastic. Uh, at this point, um, another... Aside from, I guess, rapid grave healing, Eric reveals his other ability at this point. Oh, yeah, which is a psychometry of some sort. Yes. Or also able to transfer memories to other people. Like, he can touch them and give them memories. It's just straight telepathy, right? Yeah. I mean, and he, he touches Ernie Hudson, and he gets the memories of Ernie Hudson sitting by his wife's hospital bed. Yeah, for 30 for th hours. For, for was it 30 hours, was it? For 30 hours, waiting for her to regain consciousness. And it's very affecting for um, Eric to yeah. have absorbed this, these memories. He gets memories. a bit from Sarah as well. He accidentally like, bumps her, like she's standing next to him. Right. And he gets some memories from her as well. It's not quite clear, as much as it is when he gets the memories from Ernie Hudson. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's established he has this, this power. Yeah. Um... He gets to... By the way, Ernie Hudson's walking around in his apartment wearing his police hat. Yeah. And, and, and he's in underwear. his underwear. He's in his underwear, yeah. And great. like an undershirt. And he's got his hat on. It's the funniest And thing. Eric actually tells he him to tells take his He comments off. on it. I thought he was ad-libbing this scene. I was like, <laughs> was this in the script? Or he just decided to walk around with his hat on because he's Ernie Hudson. Um, so at some point here, we get the death of Fun Boy, which happens a bit like in the comic where he comes in on him when he's in bed with... Sarah's mother, and he tells this, Je this joke about Jesus ordering three nails. Well, uh, and I think that's in the into comic. A bar. It yeah. is in the comic. Yeah. D d d Jesus walks into a bar and hands the barkeeper three nails and asks him, can you put me up? Can you put me up for the night? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. 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 It's in the comic. Yeah. Um, the, all these deaths are happening. Tony Todd goes and examines Eric's grave. I thought this was a cool bit uh, where he's like, aha, yeah, the grave's empty. He comes yeah. back. Yeah, um, this is after he's already yeah. <laughs> spoken to him. Yeah. Um, T-Bird, the villain T-Bird now, I guess he's like a, his thing is his car. I guess that's why they gave him like T-Bird car. Maybe. Well, I right, guess he course. does, there's a car chase in the comic with T-Bird too. But anyway, so there's a big car sequence in this. Finally, T-Bird's killed. He goes off. Uh, he also has a karmic death, doesn't he? Because he's yeah. killed in his car yeah. with fire. Yeah. He's the guy that sets the fires yeah. on Devil's Night, so he's yeah. burned to death. Another karmic death. Yeah. So, uh, so Fun Boy is killed with a morphine overdose. That's right. Another karmic death. And there's an interesting bit where Eric... Oh, he has a third superpower, which is the superpower to purge morphine from your veins. Yeah, bizarre. He does it to... To Sarah's mom. That's right. He like touches her arm and squeezes the morphine. She actually becomes a good mom after this. Tries to reconnect with her daughter, yeah. which is the thing that doesn't happen in the comic. No, it There's no redemption for her no. there. Um, so here again. she does. Th we do get a scene of her trying to like make amends. Yeah, the hint of of a positive, more positive yeah. relationship because she's like a, a junk druggy. Uh, I think prostitute. She sleeps with the gang members. She ignores her daughter, always telling her to get lost. Yeah. Uh, but now we have a sign that their relationship might be on that. She's been shocked out of it. She's been healed of her addiction by Eric's magic yeah. dead powers. Yeah, magic anti-drug powers. And uh, she's willing to make a, a better start. And it's not it's not played com completely saccharine because Sarah is a sassy girl and she's like, what's all this about? You know, why are you being so nice to me? Yeah. Your mum goes to throw the eggs in the bin and is about to give up on the whole thing, but then Sarah yeah. has a change of yeah, heart. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's fine. Yeah. It's played really well, I yeah, think. Yeah, I agree. 100% agree. So now I think we get the, the attack on Trash, the uh, nightclub with the office upstairs. It's a huge mess. By the way, I learned recently in the last week or two, whenever they film a club scene, um, there's no music and all of the people in the club are miming speech and they're dancing to no music. Really? When they shoot, yeah. They, the only people that are mic'd are the actors, of if course. they're mic'd at all. Of course. The main actors. So it's like a silent disco. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I just heard this somewhere in the last week or two. Wow. Okay. So I'll be. I won't be able to forget that next time I watch it. Well, we get scene. anytime eighties, nineties. You get club scenes all the time. We had them in in Blade. You know, <laughs> we it's, sure it's did. a common thing. And they they're in this movie as well. A few of them uh, because they're built on top of this club. By the way, we haven't mentioned the music. Right. I think there's one Cure song on the soundtrack. There's no Joy Division. No. There's no Bauhaus. Um, it's a lot of 90s grunge and 90s alt rock. Yeah. 
I owned this soundtrack in the 90s. <laughs> there's a of course you did. There's a Henry Rollins cover on there of a song called Ghost Rider, which is about Ghost Rider. I don't know why it's on the soundtrack. I, most of these songs are very... Actually, they're pretty far back in the mix, so you don't really notice them, but there are a few bands in the club that you have to listen to. Um, but it's not quite the right tone, given that the comic tells you what music is supposed to be in the movie, so to speak. I guess it was too expensive to get all those Joy Division. I guess so. I guess so. Um, so yeah, he, there's a massive attack here where um, basically Eric comes in and machine guns. He is using a machine gun in this scene, right? No, he's got two pistols. He's doing the gun, pistols, he's doing right. guns akimbo. He's okay, got one gotcha. in each hand gotcha. and he's shooting like mad. This is also where he gets the samurai sword. Yes. It makes much more sense here yeah. because Top Dollar It's not just our apartment decoration <laughs> like the masks. He, yeah, he, yeah, it came from somewhere. Great. The open vault. The unlocked yeah, that's vault. That's it. He leaves it open. Well, he's... He, this guy's nutcase. Top dollar. Yeah. I mean, it, he's not a real crime boss because he would be knocked over instantly because he's so nuts and incompetent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's a character... He's like a vampire. Yeah. So, after this, um, Sarah... It's basically... He's done. He's killed everybody, right? Well, he kills the last guy whose name is Scratch or... Scrut scr 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 or Crud or something? Crutch or... Scr Something like that. Scum or something like that. Who also is pretty... It has a great line to go out with. Like, uh, Brandon Lee grabs him is like, Time to die, Scratch, or whatever your name is. And he goes, I'm not Scratch. Scratch is over there. He's dead. Scratch yeah. is dead. And it's like, that's ballsy play. <laughs> and Brandon Lee goes, you're right, he is. And he throws him out the window. So, and that, which was, of course, how Brandon Lee himself, yes. so Eric himself died. And it was this oh, guy. Oh, so it was a come up and stab. Yeah. Well, yeah. the, everyone has a come up and death. Yeah. Which is great. Fine. Again, it, this is kind of like screenwriting 101. People are getting their Skank. Comic... Skank was his name. Skank. <laughs> well done. Well done. Very good. Very good. Um, so basically he's done. So he goes back to the graveyard. He's about to cl crawl back in his grave. Sarah's there. She sleeps in, she's sleeping in the graveyard for some stupid reason. Even though she's made up with her mother. Well, she's waiting for him. Because she knows he's going to come back there before. Yeah. That's going to be his last stop. Well, and again, this plays out so much better... Than in the comic because yeah. she's known him since before the first scene. We That's know right. they've got a history together. That's right. So because Bai Ling and Michael Wink kind of figured out that the crow is the source of his power, that like if we injure the crow, maybe we can get to Eric. Because yeah. Bai, Bai Ling is this is a, like a Wiccan or whatever. Yeah. So she she she's got it. She's got the inside goss. So they kidnap Sarah. Yes. And well, the Bai crow tell the crow the actual bird. Cut, somehow oh. conveys us to Eric through oh, Eric, Eric often images. sees what the crow is seeing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we get crow vision in this movie sometimes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like crow cam. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Um, oh, and it, sometimes the, the crow is often landing on Brandon Lee's shoulder. Yeah. It, it's very arresting imagery. Yeah. It looks very cool. Yeah. Incidentally, the crows in this film are not crows because you can't train crows. Okay. They are ravens. I did wonder about that because they were very well behaved. Yeah. And when they film you like can train a raven. Movie. They're very smart birds. There were five of them that acted in the movie. Crows don't like being awake. Sorry, ravens don't like being awake at night. Nor do they like oh. being wet. Oh. So this was a challenging shoot. Wow. For those ravens for that reason. If they did this now, it'd be all CG. CG birds. Yeah. 100%. Well, it was a CG bird in this too, whenever that it's flying over the city. Oh, cityscape. right. Yes, of course. Very yes, obviously yes. for that yeah. matter. Yeah. That's one of the things that doesn't look good, that flying crow. Um, so Eric needs to go rescue Sarah. She, they've taken her to a church. Uh, Tony Todd shoots the bird. Yeah, the crow goes in first. Yeah. I guess because it's... To get the sc to, to yeah. scope the place, yeah, for a crow cam. But yeah, <laughs> crow cam. Yeah. Tony Todd is waiting for him. He's got a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. He sees the crow. Bam! He shoots it. Now Eric is vulnerable. Yeah, and when they injure him, he's like permanently. He's not like auto not healing. healing anymore. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Stakes. Yeah. yeah. Stakes are good. Yeah. Um, there's a big fight. The crow pecks out by Ling's eyes. Uh, <laughs> so again, it's a come up and death. Yeah. That's karma right. death. Um, and then, the uh, top dollar gets knocked off the roof somehow. Well, in the they fight. have a final fight. It's on the roof of the church, which incidentally was filmed in a soundstage. Yeah. So it, it looks all great. looks soundstage. Yeah. It, it's it's great. I mean, it, it looks like they're on top of a church. But I think the sky looks fantastical. I think the city still looks like the city. Like it's not. I mean, it's better than Dick Tracy, but you can tell it's like yeah, it's better than Dick Tracy. Quite... But I would never have known they weren't actually on the roof of the right. church okay. if I hadn't read it. I right. think. Right. I mean, the sky. They've, they've just. It's just jet black wherever you, right. you can't see a church. Uh, despite being shot in the shoulder, Eric is now 
fighting, doing kung fu stuff and fighting with a sword, fine, it's okay. Maybe he's got a little bit of power back from the crow. Mm. Uh, but it's not enough. Top Dollar has kicked Sarah off the side of the building. She's, right, right. she's right. hanging on. That's right. But, it, but Eric needs to save her. Anyway, then we get the big reveal, which is not that big a reveal because it's clear that Top Dollar is the big bad guy. Mm. He reveals that he was the one that sent the, the, the hoods, the right. criminals, to their apartment that night. So Why he, didn't the bird know this and leave Eric alive and warn him to kill this guy as well? That's a damn good question. Maybe that is why. But, but who says that that didn't happen? Okay. Anyway, who says it didn't happen? Because the yeah. crow did go and find uh, Sarah, but you, you are right, of course. The crow should have known because it's a supernatural agent of vengeance. Yeah. But this is enough for uh, Eric to weaponize his telepathy. He grabs Top Dollar's head and says, I've got something for you. I don't need it or want it anymore. And it is the 30 hours of, of pain. Pain. Except... Except it's third hand through yes, Hudson. Yes, it's third hand. <laughs> How devastating is third hand trauma? I don't know. So it's not it's Sarah somebody, experiencing he, it, it, it. It's Ernie, probably, who, who really just wants a lead, waiting patiently besides the deathbed of somebody, hoping they'll regain consciousness for 30 hours. I guess it's filtered through... Eric's devastation it's of watching his wife his, die. It's supposed to be his grief. Yeah. So he he. It's thirty hours of grief distilled into a instant. Yeah. And of, and of course it like blasts right. Top Dollar's mind and he tumbles off the roof dead. Yeah. And then he falls on one of those like spikes or something. Oh, he it's falls like on gargoyle. Gargoyle. He falls gargoyle, horns. gargoyle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then basically Eric goes to his grave and the ghost of Shelley shows up in like. And they embrace and that's. The end. That's it. And the end credits, oddly say, based on the comic book series and comic strip by James O'Barr. I noticed that too. What did that mean? I don't know. Perhaps they knew that one day... Was there a newspaper perhaps comic? Perhaps they knew that one day a podcast that specializes in comic books and comic strips <laughs> would cover it. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first coincidence today. Yeah. <laughs> um... Okay, you want to give us any more trivia you got there? I got tons. All right, so as I mentioned, this film's budget was $23 million. Box office take $94 million. Wow. So a definite success. That's why there were four sequels. <laughs> yes. And the remake coming in the series. none of them, I think, were had no. a feature release except for this one. Oh, uh, maybe the, the second one might have. Maybe. Hold on, I think I have it in my notes. No. Yes, the second one did have a theatrical okay. release. But that was the only one, and it was not a success. Okay. Uh... Both Alex Proyas and Brandon Lee wanted the film to be in black and white. Wow. That would have been special. That would have been... I, jumping ahead, I think this movie is better than it has any right to be. Like, it's just... It's operating in pure cliche. It's just like all these tropes we've seen before. But there's like these artistic choices happening. I would agree with that. It's so stylish. And if it had been black and white, that would have been wild. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely, it would have. Uh, Alex Proyas brought on... An Australian comic artist okay. to work on the film. A man by the name of Peter Pound, based in Sydney. Huh. He did the storyboarding. Okay. Uh, this was... Uh, okay, I have a quote about Peter Pound from Jeff Most, the producer. One of the things he, Alex, did during the early stages of production was bring over a friend of his, a very established comic book artist in Australia named Peter Pound. He literally drew every storyboard as if it were a comic book panel. Huh. They were drawn to a level of detail which I had never seen and have never seen since. Hmm. This fellow, Peter Pound, you can see the storyboards online. Okay. On his website. Huh. And I'll post them on the Facebook page. Right. This was the first film that he worked on, but not the last. He also worked on... Can you guess? Uh, Dark... Dark City. Dark City. Well, this movie looks very much like Dark City. I, he did was, concept it, art too. Not just storyboarding, but concept okay. art. Okay. Was yeah. it also the same DP, the same cinematographer? I don't know about that. Okay. Uh... But he also worked on Mad Max Fury Road. This is Peter Pan. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ghost Rider. Oh, okay. And Man Thing. Interesting. So we are going to be okay. hearing about him yeah. again yeah. and seeing some more of his art. Right. Yeah, I've seen it online. It looks really... Yeah. All right. I've mentioned how this... So with three days of shooting left, Brandon Lee tragically died. Shall we talk about what happened? Okay. Yeah. So as I mentioned, as you surmised, Alex Proyas really stretched the budget and the producers really stretched the budgets on, on this film the they were doing it was all night shoots you know so you have overtime you and it was apparently a really really kind of like hard work for the actors and they started cutting corners and one thing they did was they didn't buy dummy cartridges for the guns so when huh. for prop 
For gun, when you're working with guns in cinema, you kind of have two kinds of uh, cartridges. You've got blanks, which we know what they are. That's a, a, a kind of like a bullet that just makes the sound and flash, of, but nothing comes out. Mm -hmm. And you have these things called dummy cartridges, which are the, the opposite. So the bullet is there, but there's no powder and no primer. The reason for that is it's for close-ups. Because a blank has no bullet, mm -hmm. when you have a close-up of a gun with, like a revolver especially, mm -hmm. with blanks in it, it doesn't look right. Oh. Because you can't see the... Okay. You can't see the bullets in the chamber. Okay. So they use these things called dummy cartridges. The okay. problem here is to cut costs, or perhaps corners, they made their own dummy cartridges. Okay by taking regular bullets and removing the powder. Mm. However, they left the primer. So the primer is the thing that ignites the powder, which provides the force to propel the bullet out of the gun. I guess, for I don't know why they left the primer in. I assume that if they removed it, it would, wouldn't look right. Hmm. Maybe it's part of the body of the bullet. Anyway, for whatever reason, they didn't remove it. Okay, bad. Then, uh, an actor who's not named apparently fired the prop gun in question with one of these dummy cartridges in it mm -hmm. and ignited the primer so there's no powder so the bullet didn't come out of the gun but there was enough motive force from the primer to lodge the bullet in the barrel of the gun okay causing something called a squib load where the the uh, bullet doesn't emerge from and this is dangerous because if you shoot it again then there's something obstructing the barrel oh, of the gun. Okay. All right. Then the fateful day, the scene where Funboy shoots uh, Eric as he comes into the apartment. They put blanks in the gun. Unfortunately, the person, the firearms supervisor, the armorer, had gone home for the day. Mm -hmm. And the only person there was a prop assistant. Whoa, okay. Did not know the correct procedure, which is to always check the muzzle mm -hmm. to make sure there are no obstructions. He didn't know that. He gave the gun to the actor mm -hmm. playing Funboy, who pulled the trigger what happened was it was a blank but the blank still has powder and primer it went off with as much force as a normal bullet okay which then propelled that fragment of bullet that was lodged in the muzzle with the virtually the same force as a standard bullet Whoa. out of a magnum revolver lee is shot in the abdomen quite close to the spine it, it i think pen penetrated a major artery he bled to death unfortunately he was his direction was to fall down after being shot mm -hmm. which he did i heard this bit yeah and it wasn't until Alex Prose called cut and he didn't get up that they noticed that there was a pool of blood under him. It's just terrible. Um, they called an ambulance, but it wasn't didn't come soon okay. enough to save him. So there's a scene before he goes to the window, he's shot twice. And the way it's cut in the movie, you don't see... You see two guys shooting, you don't see them shooting at him. So I don't think they use that shot in the, the movie. That footage has been destroyed. Yeah. yeah. It'll never be. It's yeah. gone gone forever yes so that used to be the most famous example of a prop gun murdering someone mm -hmm. or killing someone mm -hmm. on a movie set we now have another one yeah <laughs> uh, we'll see if that film was released this film was released originally alex pro has just called a halt right to the production he said that's it you know we're done everybody wow, home. Okay. uh paramount then paramount dropped it so principal photography is done now they've wrapped right paramount said we're not distributing this then Apparently, both Brandon Lee's fiance and his mother Linda yeah. uh, pushed for the film to be released. Lobbied hard, saying that it's his final work. He put a lot of his heart and soul into it. Yeah, very passionate about it. It needs to be released as a testament to his memory. Okay. And then, as I said, Miramax and Harvey Weinstein came to the rescue with eight million dollars, and they completed the. Whoa, eight million! Apparently, eight million. Quite a lot. Yeah, apparently. A significant percentage of the budget. Yeah. yeah. If it, I want, I, that I'll need to fact check that okay. actually. Because considering the budget's twenty three million, hmm. was that fifteen plus eight, or was that twenty three? I've also seen thirty million quoted as the budget, so maybe twenty three was the initial budget, right. and eight, thirty million, including the eight million from the Weinstein. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and it was released, as you know. I never saw it, partly because I thought it was. You never saw it before yesterday no, I never saw or this it week? Before. Yeah, I think because I thought it was unfinished. Okay. I thought I I didn't realize how li how much of the film was done. Right. I thought I would, that I was just going to go see something where Brandon. Lee's head was what was, was Game out. of Death the one where yeah. Bruce Lee like Game of Death yeah. basically that's yeah. what I you know yeah. but no it, it, it's not like that at all he's it's just literally the first few scenes and it's done quite cleverly and successfully yeah. and tastefully really um, should I talk about sequels adaptations etc we're gonna probably we'll, we might we'll get come back we might get back to the sequels on another day uh, there there is a remake coming out yep it's coming out this year so they say yeah so they say Directed by Rupert Sanders, who also did Ghosts in the Shell. Great. And... <laughs> so you know it's going to be good. And uh, Bill Skarsgård is going to play huh. Eric Draven. Okay. All right.
uh, I just have a quote to do with from both Ernie Hudson and Tony Todd about the, the pressures of the set. Hudson, it was a dark film and a dark shoot. We shot everything at night, which I hated. You do nights when you have to, but when you go back to days, it's too hard, especially in a state like North Carolina where it's cold as hell after sun. It's difficult to work that way and people get tired. You start at three or four in the afternoon and you finish at about six or seven in the morning. So you're sleep deprived. Mm. That's challenge. I think a lot of the stories of the onset weirdness stemmed from that. There were reports of a guy getting electrocuted. He didn't die, but that happened at the beginning of the shoot. There was a weird energy. Hmm. This was a, considered a plague shoot even before the terrible event. Like right. Someone impaled his hand on a screwdriver, another guy was electrocuted. Whoa. There was a hurricane that devastated the outdoor sets. Wow. Uh, Tony Todd said, We were working at a time when the laws hadn't been established about working too long, so we worked a series of 17-hour days, said Todd sternly. I'm sure you can imagine Tony Todd saying something sternly. We were working nights a lot. I think because of that, it may have caused some of the fatigue that led to the mistakes being made. And then, But he cautions that no one was complaining up to that point. When you follow something like acting, it is so rare to succeed. Many want to do it, but so few are chosen. Most of us really appreciated that. It's not something to take lightly. So on the one hand, he's implying that everyone was just happy to have the work. Yeah. But on the other, he might be saying no one felt like they could speak up. Right. All right, I think... That's just about everything for me. Okay, so let's rate these. <laughs> or abstain from rating them, maybe? Uh, I don't know. No, I'm happy to rate okay. them. So first of all, so as I said, this is just... Remember, we don't even ask a question anymore. We just say, comic yay or nay. For me, the comic is a nay. Yeah. Uh, I just, as I said, I you, you can't critique it, but I can say how I feel about it. Yeah. Which is that I don't enjoy it. I find it too emo, too... It's the, the quotes, the, the monologuing, it's too much of a kitchen sink. There's no consistent tone. The what's happening is very confusing. There doesn't seem to be any reason why Eric behaves the way he does. I don't even... I like the art in the dream sequences. There's a character as well in that called the Skull Cowboy, who's mm. very kind of like a very frightening and visceral image. Mm. I think is meant to represent a part of Eric's grief, subconscious, something or other. But... You know, also, why has he come back? It's not clear. As I said, it feels... What it's saying is that the power of Eric's grief is sufficient to bring him back from the grave. Yeah. Such is the scale of his suffering. Yeah. But <sighs> suffering is subjective. Yes. You know, who's to say that Eric's is the worst suffering that anyone has ever experienced? Well, it's not I necessarily. I think that's ludicrous. Well, people don't come back from the dead regularly. No, but... I find... No, it, I know what you're it, saying, but I think I think it's James O'Barr's grief. It is. And yep. maybe a bit of, like, wish fulfillment of some sort. I hate to say that, but it, it, it can't help but draw that conclusion, can't you? So, for those reasons, it, it's a nay. For so, it's a nay for me, too, but I'm specifically, it's a nay for me. Yes. I don't think this comic fair. is for anybody but James O'Barr. That's fair. And I think if other people might connect to that level of grief and that the imagery and the, the darkness of it, of that, I think people, some readers would connect to that, and it, definitely they did, I mean... Mm. The series it was has popular. had many yeah. sequels and stuff like that. So I, it is... I don't know if it was popular, but it... the thing is, how much of those sequels are because of the film, I wonder? Because the film was definitely popular. That's true, I think too. the comic was fairly... It was a weird black and white. And like I said, it was past the period in time in comics when that was that sure. huge boom was there as well. Sure. Um, um, I, I so it's tricky. Fair. So again, it's like, I'm not going to read it again. I know what happens. Yeah. I know the vibe of it. I know the mood of it. That All the atmospheric stuff, which I think is... I think that stuff is executed well. I don't need to reread it. So it's a nay for me. But like I said, this comic's not for me in the first place. It wasn't even necessarily for public consumption, according to James O'Barr. He didn't care whether people read it or not, Amazing. according to him. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, what about Bran Pyre, The Masquerade? Uh, <laughs> hmm. You know what? I dug this movie, as I've hinted at. Hmm. I think it's, like I said, it's it's every cliche. It seems to be, it's like a... 80s revenge movie made in the 90s. It's got very, it's got the weird villains, especially Michael Wincott and his girlfriend, which are very like, they're very much like Blade villains, you know. We're it is, they we're are like Blade villains. We're yeah. in that zone. Except even more kooky. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, but yet, it's so stylish and really well put together. Brandon Lee's really great in it. I think actually all the actors are really pretty great in yeah. it. Um, so even the little girl does good. Yeah, she's pretty good. Uh, uh, it's tough to find a kid that can yeah pull that kind of. So thing off. Uh, 
Again, it's like, I don't think this movie's gonna be, I think I don't think everybody's gonna agree. But again, as with the comic, it's hard to separate it from all the stuff around it, like Correct. Brandon's death and all that stuff, and to add weight to it that it might not have if he hadn't died like that. Like, you, we might be, if he hadn't died, would we be looking at this the same way as Showdown in Little Tokyo or Rapid Fire as like kind of a mid range 80s, 90s actioner? Maybe, but I think the Price's direction is so good. It's It looks so different. I think it's got a kind of edge. I think the supernatural stuff gives it a bit of an edge. We haven't talked about the crow symbols that he left around whenever oh, he yeah. kills somebody. He leaves a giant crow symbol of some sort, in, either in flames or like in, in some way. All yeah. that's pretty, he I think, makes it, it, makes it, elevates it a little bit of on yeah. Fun Boy's chest. Yeah. After he kills T Bird, he lights it in, I assume petrol yeah and it's the crow symbol on the ground it yeah. does look really yeah. yeah so i think there's so there's this all this stuff is kind of putting it a step above what you'd normally expect from a movie that was just like a revenge 80s revenge actioner so it's a yay for me yes yes all right my turn i agree with everything you said i was going to vote nay okay just agreeing with everything you yeah. said everything about the visuals yeah it has such a great aesthetic mm -hmm. such a distinctive aesthetic one that we'll see elaborated on in Subsequent, well, in one specific in subsequent City, yeah. film, yeah. Dark City. The plot, on the other hand, as you say, paper thin, yeah. cliche driven, characters, what characters? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're like. They're a little bit better than the co characters in the comic. I mean, yeah, in terms well, of the bad guys. They're just well, like a little bit better. That is true, and I will. I want to talk about that when we get to adaptation. The action, this action is not much to speak about. They had Brandon Lee, but. Not enough martial arts. In absolutely it. not. And com in comparison to something like the like Blade or The Matrix, which comes later. The, the action in this film is nothing to, yep. to talk about. Yep. Brandon Lee seems like a nice guy. I think he needed to put on a voice. Because often he's talking in a com I know what you mean. <laughs> in a conversational tone yeah. of voice. For all those reasons, I was going to vote, mate. But you spoke about the imagery with such passion. <laughs> that I And I felt it. Because it really does look... It really does look impressive. Yeah. So I'm, I'm saying, yeah. Okay. You're persuaded. <laughs> okay. Uh, adaptation. Okay, for me this is a yay. Yeah. A definite yay. Because they took this comic, which, as you said, is an outpouring of emotion. Yeah. And it's a film. Yeah. Tropes aren't bad. Yeah. You know, we talk about the characters. As you say, they are an Im they're very kind of like one-dimensional. But nonetheless, they're an improvement on the comic. Yes. Because there's a clear hierarchy. We can see... I think what's happened is the comic has taken stuff from movies. Right. All that stuff is taken from 80s action movies. And this time it's actually made by professional filmmakers and screenwriters who know how to write. Yeah, and I think I see David Chow's influence here. Because apparently what he did was he really re reworked kind of like the hierarchy of mm. villains and, and kind of had it so that, you know, and, and brought in the idea of their karmic fates. Mm. This is all, like, you can call it cliches or you can call it trope driven. I, and it, I don't, it, it makes it into a story that you can follow yeah. and be invested in. Similarly, the addition of, like, it's not, it has a real gothic tone. Mm. I don't think the comic has a very gothic tone, but this... I mean, the addition of the... I think the, the church... The supernatural stuff, for sure. The addition of the supernatural stuff... The crow stuff. is leading him around. That is yeah. a major important change yes, here. Yes. Bringing in the supernatural stuff, but just enough so that we're still guessing, you know, what is the crow? We don't know. We just know it's his supernatural guide. Mm. Another way in which this... And it leads him from place to place. Bai Ling, we don't know anything about her except that she's a weird chick, but she knows just enough that she thinks she can use the crow... Right to get, you know, you know, like to get immortality for herself or for top dollar. Mm. She's probably wrong, but it doesn't matter because it's just enough knowledge that they're able to weaken. And the addition of stakes in the comic, uh, Eric is invulnerable. Yeah. There's never any dramatic tension yeah. about what's going to happen. He was always going to murder those guys horribly. Yeah. In the final, of course, this is a movie, so we know there's going to be an ending that we expect. But nonetheless, there's dramatic tension when Eric can suddenly be wounded. And I was, wor I was worried about the crow, you know. It's like, look out, crow! <laughs> yeah. You know? Another way, you know, speaking of supernatural elements, the Skull Cowboy was originally a character in the movie. Right, okay. He was cast. He's played by the Hills Have Eyes guy. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, he has that unique yeah, yeah. kind of physiognomy. Uh, his role was to explain Eric's powers to him. Okay, right. And, you know... He was going to tell him that so long as you pursue vengeance, you will be invulnerable. But if you help the living, you will be weakened. Huh, okay. And that's why Eric. Uh, that's why Eric is wearing duct tape in some of the scenes, mm. because in an original, in the original film, sorry, in the original edit, in the scenes that were deleted, when Eric purges 
mum of the morphine, he that's helping the living and he's weakened oh. and then Fun Boy is able to harm him and oh. that's why he has to put on gotcha. that duct tape to seal okay. up his wounds. Excised. And look, fine. The film's better for yeah. it. Yeah. Ha taking that character out was a good choice. Right. It's a yay for me. Yeah, it's a yay for me too. I think everything, the flaws are the same flaws as in the comic. So the, the, the paper thin villains, for example. But there's so many improvements. I will say, my caveat, is that the comic is kind of unfilmable. All that grief stuff is not something you can make a movie of, and you yeah. wouldn't want to make... I want to make a movie about this guy being miserable and self-harming for two hours. You can't do it. So, this... The level of grief that you see in this movie is nowhere near the grief that you see in the comic book, I think. It gets kind of close when he first arrives back at his apartment from the grave and he's dancing around and reenacting the crime as it happened. That's as close as you get. But you don't get cutbacks to that apartment all the time where he's mm. like, I mean, we get some flashback stuff, but he's not in there by himself grieving. So in a sense, you you had to make the movie this way. You had to take out that kind of stuff yeah. to make it work. And I think it does work for that. So it's a yay for me as well. Although, you know, one of the things that we somehow didn't mention earlier is that Eric was a musician. And during the pawn shop scene, he retrieves a guitar, maybe his guitar, and we get a few cutaway scenes of him as the crow by himself, uh, emotionally and gloomily playing that guitar on rooftops. And that does channel the comic in an interesting, adaptive way. Excellent. Uh, a final question. What genre do you think this movie is? Uh, oh, Supernatural Revenge. That was a... So, I'm trying to think... That what, was a quick and confident answer. Yeah, I'm, well, I've been thinking about it. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of something else that fit is that is like the same, where somebody comes back from the grave to kill like five people in revenge. I'm sure there's a lot of examples and I'm not, they're not coming to mind off the top of my head. Yeah, I wonder if, is this the first in these films that I originally said Blade was the progenitor for. Ah. So these films that have a kind of noir aesthetic, yeah. but with a supernatural conspiratorial element and a lot of leather. Huh. I've seen it described as gothic punk. So we're I, talking about Underworld, that kind of stuff. Is underworld, cool. yeah. Blade, The Matrix. Yeah, right. So we're, we talked about it in the Blade episode. That's where I said Blade. You know, Blade is sometimes called the original superhero movie, which mm. I don't agree with. I also don't think this film is really a superhero movie, despite it no. having superhero tropes. Yeah. So I think it's been described. It's been described as gothic punk. I think that's a worthless term. I think the way they people attach the word punk to everything now is mm. just completely pointless. Uh, I've also, I, I think maybe. Especially this film, maybe it's in a genre of its own, perhaps with Dark City. Call it gothic noir. <laughs> <laughs> gothic, but gothic noir is yeah. It doesn't that could that could exist without any supernatural elements. I sure, think. sure. Yeah, I think it gothic. It, it often helps if there's a. But isn't most noir like Nightmare Alley? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't that be noir gothic noir anyway? Um, well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe I'm cleverer than I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> okay, so we have a new segment this week, which is comic book mail oblivion, because we have our first letter. Fantastic. I got, a, I got a DM on Twitter. That's so good. About last week's episode on Akira. This came from uh, Aiden uh, at, at Koi Boy B Boy, is his handle? Is that the handle? Sure. Um, he said, uh, I'm listening to the new episode of comic book movie Oblivion on Akira and can share a bit about the different English versions of the manga. The sound effects in the Dark Horse and Kodansha paperback edition are taken from the French edition by Glenat. That also means the retouch, dialogue cleaning, and art modifications in it are possibly carryovers from the French edition. Kodansha released the paperback version pretty much identical, but then the box set with hardcovers is unflipped. The translation is still based on the Marvel Epic release, then the Dark Horse edits, and finally, there's a credit for additional translation adaptation in the new editions. All volumes credit Stephen Paul with that, and the final two also add Co Ransom. So, we do have an unflipped edition with a Slightly different translation from Kodansha again, so Kodansha's second release. This wow. is wow, that'd be the, one uh, to get. On box it. it said lettering is by Evan Hayden and Scott O'Brown, and all sound effects and signs are left in Japanese. Even better. Signs get margin notes, and as do some handwritten asides, typed sound effects in bubbles are replaced with a font, but all handwritten SFX are translated with a glossary at the end of the volume. The Akira Club book uses your translation and seems identical. 
Ah, so they did use your translation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He even sent me a picture of the credits page and there's my name. And I don't have a copy. Uh, so that's it. Thank you, Aiden, for that. Fantastic. All right. So please uh, like, subscribe, rate, review. Please join our Patreon. Help us keep the lights on. Uh, please join us on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, Feel free to send us some more direct messages yes, on Twitter. You can reach me on Twitter. You can reach me. Our email address is in the show notes every week, so you can reach us that way. Indeed. Make comic book mail oblivion a regular segment. Yes, we would Please. like this segment to continue. Uh, was there anything else I needed to add? I think that's it. Uh, okay, so next week we will be doing The Killer. That's right. Brand new release. It only came out a few weeks ago. I watched it randomly. Didn't know it was based on a comic until I saw the credits. Amazing. So I'd seen like headlines about it and people were talking about it, but I didn't see anybody say... So it wasn't on our list, even. It wasn't even on, on the list. On our list of hundreds of comics. On their list of... Uh, films based on comics. 499 movies based on comic books. And it wasn't, and it wasn't on there because I would not seen any press or any... None of the comics websites were like, hey, this new movie's out based on a comic book. I can't wait to find out why. Mm -hmm.